Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning and for the people that are here. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit within us and your holy angels. And Father, please direct our thoughts to heavenly things and empty my heart of selfishness and speak through me because I do not want to speak my own words because they are nothing. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the beginning, before sin, in God's kingdom, every subject of the land lived in peace. The law of His kingdom was love, the language was grace, and everybody spoke that language, everybody lived that language. There was no jeering note of pride, no struggle for supremacy, there was no fear. And this is the kingdom of love. And there was no place unlike it in the universe. And, but this cherubim, glory from head to foot, invented something that we call rebellion. And it cut right to the peace of, the, of God's kingdom. And the first fruits were fear and pride. And it led to a struggle for supremacy. The new empire had to be cast out into darkness, had to be cast out of, that, of God's kingdom. So desperately, there is desperately and, and homeless and angry. And I want you to try to enter into the minds of the angels as they saw this new rebellious angels set their eyes in a beautiful blue planet and and lean their race and with this planet and and show that God is not love and that is not power and that is the, that it's nothing and try to enter into the heart of God Himself. He who saw, well, while Eve was still in the process of swallowing the fruit, the nakedness and wretchedness of soul that would be moments later, and the wretched and unending suffering that would be 6,000 years later. And this right now, this wretched unending suffering in the world is our normal. There is, I did some research, and there is in the world 30 million slaves, more than it was in the time of slavery. I guess this is the time of slavery. And 210 million orphans, 795 million starving people, people that don't have food, enough food to survive, to be healthy. And there is hundreds and hundreds of wars, and we don't just hear about two or three, but there's hundreds every day happening and people dying every day. But for us, this is our normal. This is, this is how it is. This, is. this is the world. But this is not normal. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I entitled this devotional speech the world the the world's biggest problem. Would you like to know what is the world's biggest problem? It's not that we have 30 million slaves or or 210 million orphans or millions of people starving. The world's biggest problem is that the solution is a conspirator in the crime. 
This great tragedy that we call suffering is the result of a great tragedy that the universe calls sin. Sin that leaves the world with an aching void that nothing can fill its withering hunger that you and I have been commissioned to do something about by, by, by the grace of God, by pointing to the light. Matthew 5.16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We have a chance. This calamity is, an, is also an opportunity. It's also an opportunity because you and I have the opportunity to point out to the world in this generation that sin is a lie and love is for real and that it's a power and that it changes things. 1 Peter 1.14, if you want to turn with me, 1 Peter 1.14. First Peter 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. How can we do that? We have a chance to do something by uplifting the standard of holiness. But we are not holy, so we cannot convince anyone of the, of, of the beauty of holiness. And that is the world's greatest problem. What the world needs, brothers and sisters, is a view of what is holy. It needs unselfishness, it needs humility, it needs grace, it needs healing, it needs, it, it needs charity. But how in the midst of all this that we call normal is this supposed to happen? And it's just by one thing. It's by pointing to Jesus. I would like to read this quote. It's from Desire of Ages, 141, paragraph 5. It says, Now that Jesus has ascended to heaven, His disciples are His representatives among men. Were to be his representatives among men. And one of the most effective ways of winning souls to him is in exemplifying his character in our daily life. Our influence upon others depends not so much upon what we say as upon what we are. Men may combat and defy our logic, they may resist our appeals, but a life of disinterested love is an argument that they cannot gainsay. A constant, consistent life characterized by the meekness of Christ is a power in the world. <coughs> the greatest tragedy in the universe is that we, the body, do not possess the spirit of the infinite God. What the world need, needs is Christ, the body of Christ filled with the spirit of Christ. But why, why we do not possess the spirit? Our eyes are too low. We are consumed with our normal. Our minds are occupied with things small, we just stay like this. We, we don't want to go forward. We don't ask for more. Because we think that this is how it is. The world needs to be introduced to the living Christ. And that will not happen until we individually are introduced to the living power of the gospel. And we are called to a higher standard. We, I was talking about the body, and the only way that the, God, the body can be bound together is by love. In Ephesians, turn with me to Ephesians 4.15. Ephesians 4.15. Let's see how we all fit together. What is that, that which <coughs> bind us together? Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head of even Christ. 
from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So we edify our, we edify each other in love. And I would, I would talk about that later. So we have a standard that we have to attain. Be holy, then be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I would like to, I, I would like to read this quote from Acts of the Apostles 5.31. It says, God calls upon us to reach the standard of perfection in places before us the example of Christ's character in His humanity perfected by a life of constant resistance of evil, the Savior showed that through the cooperation with divinity, human beings may in this life attain perfection of character. This is God's assurance that us, to us, that we too may obtain complete victory. But how we can attain this? In Romans 6.23 it says that the wages of sin is death. In Romans 3.23 it says, For all have sinned and, and come short to the glory of God. So all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. We have one sentence. And this is, you, you sinned, you die. But, that, that verse keeps going though. It says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Scripture, there is the law of the gospel, which is higher than the law of sin and death. Of sin and death, and this is how we find our way back to the power of Jesus Christ. This is the way back to life for the sinner, and that is the gospel. I really like this quote in First Testimonies, uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume One, page one hundred. 144, paragraph 2 says, We can overcome, yes, fully entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation, and sit down at last with Him. I remember one time there was this pastor that came to the church and he was going to have a revival weekend and talk about how to revive the people and how to revive us. And, and um, he was saying that we can't be sinless in this world, that we cannot be righteous. And I was like, I was hearing people saying amen. I'm like, Lord, have mercy on these people. <laughs> like, why did Jesus come to die for us? Why did he come? Because if you say amen that we are not gonna reach we're not gonna reach that standard, it's like okay, well he came for just nothing. What was his purpose? Because if we want if there's sinners in heaven, you know, God loves us so much. If somebody there's people that believe that, okay, I wanna be a sinner, but I wanna go to heaven. But God loves so so much the people, the humanity, that he would know that if there would be a sinner in heaven, he will be miserable. He could not bear there to live in heaven because everything is so holy and so perfect that if there's there's somebody that is not perfect and that comes short to that, they're not gonna want to be there. And God doesn't want us to go through that. That's why He wants us to, to be able to enjoy fully of Him in heaven. And that really made me really sad when that pastor came and talked about that. It's like, no, that's not true. And I was going to give this same talk like two weeks later. I was like, should I do this? Like, <laughs> Because... Here's me, you know, like I'm, I, I'm, I didn't go to, a, to Andrews University, but he went there for years, and, but I still did it. So, um, we need to pray more. It is our privilege to have faith and salvation. 
The power of God has not decreased. His power, I saw, would be just as freely bestowed now as formerly. It is the church of God that, we, that have lost their faith to claim, their energy to wrestle, as did Jacob crying, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Enduring faith has been dying away. It must be revived in the hearts, in the hearts of God's people. There must be a claiming of the blessing of God. Faith, living faith, always bears upward to God in glory. And belief, downward to darkness and death. I, I, for some reason I don't have the reference of this quote, but I can give it to you later. We often pray, like, Lord, I want, I want perfection of character. I want that, I want your spirit. I want that, I want you to change me. But we pray for the, to receive the latter rain, that we may reflect Christ. But after we get up of prayer and we just do our own thing, it's like, yeah, and we forget. And are we going to have faith in the promises of God that He will help us? He gave us unlimited supplies of, of, of promises, of blessings, but we have limited progress we, because we do not have enough faith. We do not, we, for some reason, we don't, don't want to believe what God says that we don't want to believe in His promises. Say, well, He just created the whole world. He created you. He's your maker, designer. But no, I don't, I don't know if I can trust Him completely. Like, this is, this is too easy. You just have to, you just have to keep His commandment. You just, is that, that, is that it? Philippians 3.9. Let's turn to Philippians 3.9. <coughs> Philippians 3.9 says, And be found in him not having thine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness with, which is of God by faith. How do we have more faith? How do we get more faith? <coughs> Let's go to Romans 10.17. Romans 10, 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The word of God. Hmm. I'm going to go through many verses in this section, so if you want, you can just note the verses. So let's, let's see what, what is this Word of God. We know that is the Bible. But let's go deeper. In John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then Revelation 19.13 says, And He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. Now, what did, why, what did this Word become? In John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 4 says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. <coughs> then, in 1 John 1, 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. So Jesus is the word of life. And in 2 Tim Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the Word. Because the Word gives life to the sinner. The Word is going to give life to people. But ne we need to understand this Word. So here it says, Preach the Word. And what we are to preach? What is the Great Commission that Christ gave the, the disciples? In Mark 16, 15, it says, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And how long is this gospel going to be preached? In Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And nations, and then shall the end come. So we're to preach this until the end is come. And what we also need to understand what we are to preach. In Romans 1:16 and 17 says, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And it is written, The, shall, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Now, how it's righteousness, is, is righteousness connected to life? And Proverbs 12, 28 says, In the way of righteousness is life, and the pathway thereof there is no death. And then Proverbs 21, 21, He that followeth after the righteousness, and mercy findeth life, righteousness and honor. We can see that the gospel is so powerful. It gives life to people. Amen. We see it gives a purpose to people. And that is the, the, one of the greatest problems in the world, that people do not know their purpose. People are empty. They are empty. They are hungry. They are thirsty. And they are all, every day, they are looking for, for something that would fill their, their emptiness. And they do not find it. They, they, they go to drugs, movies, parties, friends, video games, and trying and put more and more and more in that hole that they have, but it's not filling. It's not filling at all. And here we are, we have the Word of God. We have all this message, all this knowledge, all this water, and we're walking around and wondering, do these people need food? Do these people need... Are, are they thirsty? Are they hungry? We're like, oh, maybe not. I'm just going to keep going through my... I'm just going to go study my Bible in my room. I, I don't need to share with these people. Probably, probably they don't want to. But we see it. We see it, how hungry they are and how empty they are and how miserable and depressed. And <sighs> but... It's, why is this not happening? Because it's not, this is, the gospel is not a living power in, in our lives. It's not a living principle. So how to live in the gospel? By looking, believing, and leaving. And let's turn to John 1.29. John 1.29. Let's see what, what it means to look. The next day, one twenty, John one twenty nine. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, "Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away some sin of the world." Oh, oh. oh. away the sin. The sin is just the, everything. When we behold Him, but of course, our eyes are just too low. We're, we're, we don't want to behold Christ for some reason. We prefer to look at ourselves and to see. We want righteousness, but it's like, I'm, I'm just going to look at myself. See if I can be more righteous. But that's not how it works. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. By beholding Christ... By behold, we become changed. Amen. Remember the children of Israel when they were just complaining, and God is like, Well, here are the serpents, and they started to get bitten by the serpents, and Moses had to take the serpent and tell people, Look at it, and you shall leave. But what did it mean to, to look at that? It really meant that the parents had to take their eyes off their dying children, have, had to take off their eyes from their present circumstances. circumstances sorry, thank you. And, um, and had to, to look at that so they may live. They had to forget to, to not look at what was happening, but just behold. <laughs> 
by beholding we become changed. Where our eyes goes, our heart follows. The question to face in this generation is which kingdom has my gaze? Reserve your eyes, your physical eyes and the eyes of your heart for God. Determined to be stubbornly dedicated to that which is holy. And reject the evidence of the fallen world which evidence is a lie. It's just telling you lies after lies after lies. It's just taking our, your eyes off Jesus. Every time we're like, oh, I failed. Okay, you failed. But do, don't take your eyes off of Jesus because if you do, you really failed. Yes. Amen. But when we keep looking at Jesus, even if we fail, is that is when we grow. Amen. We have put enough garbage in our minds. There's a second step. Believe. What does it mean to believe? Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. To trust in Jesus is to believe in Him. Amen. To have abiding, unbounded confidence in Him. When such trust exists, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. So if looking is the evidence of your allegiance, then believing is the essence of what it means to become new. And the essence of real believing is looking, turning, and renouncing. When, when you're all men, is like, here, you should... You should do this. But we're like here, like having communion with Christ. And we're like, oh, that's true. I've been working a lot of time. Maybe I should just relax. No. Turn. Turn from that which is unholy. Even if it has to be a hundred times a day. And renounce to the fallen world, to, to sin. We're to believe the promises of God. That there we receive promise. Ye, ye have not because ye has not. We do not ask enough. We have a lot of things to ask. But we do not ask. For some reason we do not ask. Because we don't have faith. The spirit of prophecy says that we do not trouble our father enough. We stand as a link between two worlds. One which is real and one which is a rebel and is fallen. And we are supposed to po point from one to another. I have this quote that really helped me a lot in, in my life. There was a time when I was really seeking for perfection. I was reading all these quotes about perfection, all these verses about perfection, be holy. I was like, oh, how, I want to do this, but how can I do it? So I remember in that time, as I was reading these quotes, every day I was waking up and I was like, Lord, please help me to do this. Please serve me with this, this problem, with this sin, sins. And um, every day, by the time I went to bed, I was so discouraged because I failed. Every day I was failing more and more and more and more. And like one day I would have a victory and I'll be like, wow, praise the Lord. But then the other days it'll be miserable. And I would get so discouraged that I didn't, I, I didn't have, I didn't want to read any more of my Bible because it was just like, I don't want to do this every day. And then I read this quote. And it's in Review and Herald, May 3rd, 1881. I want you to take note of this quote. Review and Herald, May 3rd, 1881. And it starts in paragraph 2. 
through 5. It says, Many who are sincerely seeking for holiness of heart and purity of life seem perplexed and discouraged. They are constantly <clears throat> sorry, looking for the, to themselves <coughs> and lamenting their lack of faith. And because they have no faith, they feel that they cannot claim the blessing of God. These persons mistake faith for feeling. They look above the simplicity of true faith and thus bring great darkness upon their souls. They should turn their mind from self to dwell upon the mercy, mercy and goodness of God and to recount His promises and then simply believe that He will fulfill His word. We are not to trust in our faith, but in the promises of God. We, when we repent of our past transgressions of His law and resolve to render obedience in the future, we should believe that God, for Christ's sake, accepts us and forgives our sins. Amen. Darkness and discouragement will sometimes come upon the souls and threaten to overwhelm us, but we should not cast away our confidence. We must keep the eye fixed on Jesus, feeling or no feeling. We should seek faithfully per to perform every known duty and then calmly rest in the promises of God. At times, a deep sense of our unworthiness will send a thrill of terror through the soul, but this is no evidence that God has changed toward us or we toward God. No effort should be made to rein the mind up to a certain intensity of emotion. We may not feel today the peace. Uh, sorry, I just lost my the peace and joy which we felt yesterday. But we should, by faith, grasp the hand of Christ and trust Him as fully in the darkness as in the light. Satan may whisper, "You are too great of a sinner for Christ to save." While you acknowledge that you are indeed a sinful and unworthy, you may meet the tempter with a cry. By virtue of, of uh, the atonement, of, I claim Christ as my Savior. I trust not my own merits, but the precious blood of Jesus, which cleanses me. This moment, I hang my helpless soul on Christ. The Christian life must be a life of constant, living faith and an unyielding trust, a firm reliance upon Christ will bring peace and assurance to the soul. Did you hear this quote? When I, when I read this quote, I was like, what have I been doing all this time? I was not beholding Christ. I was just looking at myself, like trying to change myself with my own power. But I was not abiding Christ. Turn, turn, turn from that, that which is unholy. Turn from that which is selfish. Turn from everything that is not true. Even if it needs to be a hundred times a day. We need no longer to serve the flesh because the promises of God are greater. Our home is heavens. We, we should not accept the, the, the clamoring of sinful flesh. We are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That is what the, the Bible says. In Him, we are a new creature. And all things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This other quote is from Youth Instructor, August 24, 1899. Youth Instructor, August 24, 1899, paragraph 2. This is of the will of God, the Apostle says, even your sanctification. This sanctification means perfect love, perfect obedience, entire conformity to the will of God. We are to be sanctified to Him through obedience to the truth. Our conscience must be purged from dead works to serve the living God. If our lives are conformed to the life of Christ through the sanctification of mind, soul, and body, our example will have a powerful influence on the world. We are not... Perfect, but it is our privilege to cut away from the entanglement of self and sin and go on unto perfection. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of God of the Lord, are changing to the same image from glory to glory. 
even as by the Spirit of the Lord, great possibilities, high and holy attainments are placed within the reach of all who have true faith. Shall we not anoint our eyes with eyes solve, that we may discern the wonderful things God has for us? Paul's sanctification was a constant conflict with self. I die daily, he said. Every day his will and his desires conflicted with duty and the will of God. But instead of following inclination, he did the will of God, however unpleasant and crucifying to his nature. If we would press forward to the mark of our high calling in Christ Jesus, we must show that we are emptied of all self and supply with the golden oil of grace. There is the, the right action of the will, right there. I die daily. We are not to change ourselves. We're not to be like, okay, I'm going to make myself perfect. We can't make ourselves perfect. We're, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Christ is the only one that can take those filthy rags and put the robe, the robe of righteousness, the white raiments, <coughs> we cannot do it. And the only thing that we can do is surrender. It's the right action of the will. It's choosing. You always have a choice every day, every moment of your life, every minute, every hour. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose God's kingdom or the fallen kingdom? And many times we just prefer to go the other way, the wrong way. But it's by our will and the faith that we have in Christ. It's like, no, I'm going to choose, even if I want to do this so bad, even if I want to say this, but we choose not to do it. That's walking in the path of victory. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. Psalms 33.6 33, says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. So are we the ones that create this new creature in us? No. Is God, is the Lord that made the heavens, is the one that is going to create this new creature. In 1 John 3, 14 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So if you want to know if you're living the new life, then you will know if you love the brethren. But this Satan is really smart. He sure really changed the perception that the real love. Now we're, we think that it's all sentimentalism and oh, so really nice and, and kisses and hugs and oh, how are you? Happy Sabbath! And no, oh, I'm sure you're... I'm glad to see you. No, that's not it. That is not the true love. That is not what God... what was in the beginning. God's love is something way above that. It's charity. And we need to, to study charity. We need to study this love to understand because this is the answer for everything. And when we understand this, God... Like we can bear, we can have the fruits of this, the fruit of the spirit. If you, it's really interesting. So in Galatians five twenty two it says, "But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law." If you really, if you study each one of these, you can see that they are all together. You cannot separate them. They are just like a chain. They're just a fruit. There's like all the nutrients. And if you really look and then you read Corinthians 13 and you look more at, at charity, it's like the fruit of the Spirit is, is exactly what charity, what char charity is. And that is the character of God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. If we truly understand what, what each one of these nutrients is, 
we will understand what is true charity and we will be able to love the brethren. <sighs> I have this quote from Mount, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 204. It says, The victory is not won without much earnest prayer, without the humbling of self at every step. Our will is not to be forced into cooperation with divine agencies, but it must be voluntarily submitted. Were it possible to force upon upon you with a hundredfold greater intensity the influence of the Spirit of God, it would not make you a Christian as fit, a fit subject for heaven. Heaven, the stronghold of Satan would not would not be broken. The will must be placed on the side of God's will. You are not able of yourself to bring your purposes and desires and inclination into submission to the will of God. But if you are willing to be made willing, God will accomplish the work for you. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. But we need to be willing to do it and He will, he will be like more, he'll be like, yes, I will do it for you. But every day you're like, oh, I don't know. I'm just going to choose to do this other thing. I'm just going to choose to just not not help other people. And we also have to have our minds set on Christ. There's a quote in the Spirit of Prophecy that says that if we would communicate, if our heart would communicate with Christ, like every moment of the day, Satan would not have any room in our hearts. Therefore, we will not sin. And 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. That means, it doesn't mean that you have to be on your knees every day, and all, like all day long. It means that our thoughts and our affections and our feelings are up above our heavenward and we're communicating every th little things that we're doing, every every work. We're we're trying to do it for. We want to do it for the glory of God. Because in Corinthians ten thirty one says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. When we do that, and we when we set our affection on things above and not of things of this earth, God. Jesus can abide in us. We are inviting Him to abide in us. And when we do that, which, like doing these things, is the right action of the will, is, is we're willing to do these things and to think about God and to communicate with Him, He will be able to abide in us. And that's what we want. That's what we need. Christ abiding in us. Because a branch cannot bear fruit for itself. We, you can expect a stick seeing, laying there. It's like, okay, someday that will have a fruit. No, that's not how it is. It has to be connected to the vine. It has to be watered. It has to take the nutrients. It has to be deep-rooted. The world, the world needs living epistles known and read of all men, citizens of heaven living here on earth, Amen. with eyes for higher things, men and women who are consumed for that which is holy, who despise earthly things, men and women who esteem truth about earthly treasure, men and women who do not care about their own comfort as much as they care about the glory of the omnipotent God, and they're strong enough to esteem the favor of God above the air they breathe and to become proof that God is true and God is real, that, is, that He is love. This is what you were born to be. Life is not about finding yourself as many people in the world says, oh yes, you need to find yourself, you need to be yourself. No, it's not about finding yourself. It's about discovering who God created you to be. Because He has higher thoughts for us. He has higher ways for us. That we'll, we, we cannot even see. We don't see the end from the beginning. But He does. <coughs> this is how the world would know what love is. And the world needs to know what love is. 
And this is how we change from being the problem to the solution. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would forgive, forgive our sin and our ignorance and so the times that we spent on doing things that are not preparing us for heaven, that are not helping in the, this great work that we are commanded to do. Father, you commanded us to preach the gospel to all nations, and here we are having this message, and we're not, we're not sharing it. We're just keeping it to ourselves, and we're, we're just, our minds are, go to things that don't matter. Father, I pray that you forgive, forgive us, and I pray that you may dwell in us, that we may consecrate ourselves every morning to you, that we may give our hearts to you, that we may choose every moment of our life your kingdom. Father, we don't want to be anymore a problem in this world. We want to be the solution, and we want to help people to find you. <coughs> but Father, work a miracle in our lives. And I pray that we may receive you fully. Sprinkle our hearts with clean water. Take away our righteousness, our filthy righteousness. And put the wide rose of righteousness, of your righteousness, Lord. We need you so much, and the world there needs you a lot more. And I pray that this, in this camp meeting, that this may move our hearts and that we prepare us, that we may be so close to you that after this camp meeting, we may reach many, many people because you are so close. And we do not realize that we're still selfish, but I know you can do, you can fulfill your promises in us if we're faithful and we have faith. Increase our faith and help us to not forget these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.